So the reading is taken from Mark 1, uh, verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. And the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what's this? A new teaching? And with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning uh, to you. Um, today is the, the fourth of our six-week mini-series on the foundations of Jesus' ministry in Mark chapter 1. It's just looking at the very first chapter. So we've been asking, what were Jesus' own foundations and his priorities, and what can we 21st century people learn that deepens our own discipleship as this year uh, continues. Well, this morning is about confronting evil, and it's effectively a prequel to Ian's talk last week. Um, I think that there were only about three people from the, today's congregation there last week, so we're largely a new bunch. Well, Ian talked about the very good news of the kingdom of God, and he spoke about the doorway into it, namely, so the door has an, a plate on it which names it repentance. And repentance is um, admittedly a very religious sort of word. We never use it outside. So let me decode it for you. Though what it means is a change of heart and mind that leads to a clear 180 degree change of direction. So it means that from now on, I commit myself to follow Jesus, to live by his teaching. And it's not so much about you know, following a, a Haynes manual, it's a, more about a personal apprenticeship to the author, the master designer. Now, if you've not listened to Ian's talk, um, please do. You'll find it on YouTube. You can locate it via the church website. But before we uh, go any further, um, we'll just quickly pray. So, Father, we want to pray that, uh, that everyone who hears your word would respond in the right sort of way. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we've uh, arrived at uh, what amounts to Jesus' first showdown with evil since his uh, 40 days in the Judean wilderness. We call that the temptations. And while that was a private fight, if you like, this incident is very public. And actually it's a landmark event. And we won't recap the entire story. But Jesus uh, recently moved from his hometown in Nazareth, uh, which you'll see on the, uh, the, the slide. So he's moved about 30 miles-ish as the crow flies um, by road <coughs> to Capernaum, where he is invited to preach in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And out of the blue, he gets a heckler who doesn't challenge his teaching but actually challenges her identity. What have you got to do with us, Jesus? I know who you are. And Jesus demands silence and orders the demon 
out. And to everyone's astonishment, uh, the demon complies and evacuates. Very obviously, it's visible, it's audible. He shakes like a leaf, he shrieks. And not surprisingly, Jesus becomes the talk of the town because nobody has ever seen such a display of spiritual authority. Well, today's passage is quite a tricky one to preach on. Why is that? Well, I think there are several reasons. First of all, it's mired in preconceived ideas. And secondly, it's a crunch point for us. You see, it, it brings us head to head with major culture clashes between um, ancient and modern, between East and West, between entire worldviews like intellectual rationalism on one side and the supernatural experience on the other. You could style that as theoretical versus practical. And what we can't afford to do is this. We really mustn't try to duck it just because it's an awkward subject. Now what the Bible says here is in direct opposition to the modern rationalist Western worldview. But on the other hand, it's in complete agreement with most of the rest of the world, even today. Now, interestingly, the traditional Western rationalist intellectual worldview is changing. Well, I don't know whether you've clocked that. I'll back it up in a minute. Now, as a modern Christian, a thousand and one questions come bubbling up every time you have a discussion about evil and its nature. And some of those are very broad questions and others are very focused and specific. So given the limited time, what do we most need to know? So we're going to focus on three of the most obvious questions. And here's the first one. Are demons real? Or are they merely ancient fiction to explain epilepsy and mental illness? Because that's how the secular world will characterize it, and perhaps liberal Christians as well. So here in the West, the prevailing philosophy is um, generally known as intellectual rationalism. So skeptical elites scornfully reject the idea of disembodied entities like angels and demons with uh, apologies to the Dan Brown reference and he might believe in them but officially we in the West don't. But despite that, according to a fairly recent poll actually in Scotland, about one in three Brits do believe in a spirit world. But if you venture outside of Europe and America to the two-thirds world, the majority of the planet, it's widely accepted. So Asia and Africa have never fully bought into rationalism. And that doesn't make them inferior and us superior. So over here, Western Christianity has worked very hard to kind of blend the Bible with, uh, with rationalism. And... In truth, they are partially compatible, but not entirely. So, for example, the whole thesis of the Bible is that we, human beings, and planet Earth are smack dab in the center of a cosmic battle between good and evil, and we have to pick a side. There's no such thing as neutrality, because unfortunately, by default, we're on the wrong side. Wrong because evil is never, ever your friend. Now, perhaps you've never really seen it up close. Uh, it's easy to dismiss something that you've never personally seen, but some of us have. Things that are not explicable as mental illness demonization as the bible actually gospels describe it rather than possession by the way uh, is a different thing now while i'm touching on what it's not 
of all the Christian doctors I know, and I know a lot, no one thinks that epilepsy is demonic. Now, I get why people sometimes think this. English Bible translations use the word convulsion or seizure in a couple of places, and people equate that with epilepsy, but actually the Greek term is non-specific. It's sort of more along the lines of having a fit. And if I say John is having a fit in the corner over there, I mean, it could mean an epileptic fit, but it could equally mean he's having a tantrum, a paddy, or it could mean actually he's swooned, he's fainted. So what it is is a description of highly abnormal behavior that's to an observer, but it's not a specific medical diagnosis. So epilepsy and I contend mental illness are not by and large demonic there are uh, some untidy edges to that statement but nevertheless evil entities demons are real so here's the second one what is evil really I mean how do you define evil if you have no fixed point of reference, and of course I'm thinking Bible here, what's evil today may be good in 10 years' time. And what's to stop it from changing? Well, here's something to think about. Okay? So Western culture has changed beyond recognition in my adult lifetime. But here's the thing. It's still moving. We're in transit. So the obvious question is, where are we going? Where is it headed? So apart from the woke juggernaut that is taking the West by storm, there are other parallel changes that are going completely under the radar that have been slowly rehabilitating evil. I can give you lots of examples. Here's a very surface one. Before I was born, if you approved of something, this is my older sister's world, it was nice, everything was nice. And during my childhood, the word was great. And I still use that word quite a lot. And then I noticed that youngsters started using it, it's bad, meaning it's good, or it's wicked. But in the last decade or so, it's now evil, if they approve it. Now, is that just words? Is it just surface? Is it trivial semantics? I don't think so. And here's why, because it's not the only thing. So have a look at this slide. So I'm going to leave you a few seconds in a minute just to kind of take it in. What it is, is a, it's a montage of current shows or films, or very recent ones, that actively glamorize the occult. Have a look. I don't know whether you've seen any of them yourself. You might have. What's the direction of travel here? Where do you think it's leading us? See, it's not harmless. See, people sometimes think it's equivalent to a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale like Hansel and Gretel or something like that, but it's not. Because under the new regime, good and evil are being switched. Do you get that? And the upshot is that youngsters in particular are being sucked into that world. And I think we can expect far more crunch encounters of the sort described in this morning's passage in coming years. So be ready. And the third and final question is, can Christians be directly affected by evil? Well, the principal takeaway from this gospel reading is that Jesus has absolute authority over evil. Here's an excerpt from one of John's letters. You, dear children, are from God. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. 
So who's the one with the power? Well, we are. Here's another one. This is from James. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So actually, you just need to stand your ground and say no. And that's all. You have the power in your own hands if you are in Christ. So if you are in, if you are Jesus' disciple and you have the Holy Spirit, you are safe. And what's more, you have his delegated authority yourself if confronted. That's pretty good news, isn't it? So there is no need ever to be afraid of this kind of thing. Unless... Because if we willfully, consciously disobey Jesus and we dabble in the occult or porn or indulge in corrupt business practice, we remove ourselves from God's protection. It will not go well for us if that is the case. God will let us suffer because it's the kindest thing he can do to get us back. Sometimes we have to feel the heat. But if we maintain a close relationship with Jesus and we live in his shadow, we're untouchable. There is one frequently underestimated, um, less obvious way of sabotaging our spiritual lives though. Um, and that's to make excuses for our own mundane, low-level, workaday evil, which we call sin. There are some, here are a few th typical things that we turn a, a blind eye to. I dare say you can extend it. So if I slag off colleagues at work, if I'm habitually, indiscriminately cynical about everything and everyone, if I indulge in gossip or just don't challenge it, if I routinely bend the truth to suit me and my agenda, if I care more about my holiday or my Netflix subscription than the poor, if so, then I'm joining hands with evil. Whatever face I present to my friends at church. And if that niggles you, well, good. Because it means that God is on your case. And he's still challenging you because he cares about you. So yeah, you and I, we can be affected by evil. But there is an antidote and that's keeping company with Jesus. So to finish with, here are a few very straightforward take home points. So the first one we've already just covered, so it's never excuse your own mundane evil. Secondly, realize that Jesus has total authority over the over the enemy. You pick the right side. Third, don't be afraid. Because if you're walking hand in hand with Jesus, you are immune, you are untouchable. Defy him and you're not. Beware of culturally acceptable dabbling in evil. If you're watching occult movies, you are tacitly approving of it. That's consulting with the enemy. Keep your focus positive on God, on kindness and truth and grace because God is good all the time. Think of that. Never obsess about evil and do not seek confrontation with evil. If it comes to you, fine, but even then never tackle it alone. Jesus is the only one who did that actually. The disciples were always in twos and Paul always had companions with it. Never tackle it alone. 
And lastly, just to reiterate what I said at the start, um, if you weren't here last week, have a look at Ian's talk from last week. So the defeat of Satan ushers in the kingdom of God. And as I said, this talk really is a prequel to his talk. They go hand in hand. And that should give us plenty to think about, to act on, and to be hugely encouraged by. Amen.